Welcome to another evening with Kenneth Cox and his Dimensions of Prophecy team. I'm Brenda Wood. Did you ever wonder what happens to a person when they die? Do the dead retain their senses? Can they see, hear, taste, or touch? Do they experience such things as joy, sorrow, and pain? Many people have a lot of questions about death. During tonight's presentation, you'll find great comfort from God's Word, the Bible. Together, we'll find out exactly what happens to a person at the time of death. Let's join Pastor Cox now with tonight's interesting and greatly reassuring topic, our beloved dead. Good evening to each of you. Happy to welcome you back tonight. Tonight we're going to look at the subject of our beloved dead. I don't know how many of you have ever had the opportunity to visit the cemetery in Arlington, Virginia. But if you've ever gone there, you may have watched the changing of the guard at the tomb of the unknown soldier. And as you stood there and you looked out across the thousands of graves, maybe through your mind, may have passed the question that went through the mind of the prophet of old when he said, when a man dies, shall he live again? What happened? to an individual at death. As ministers, uh, we probably have more opportunity to attend funeral services than anybody else. And I can think over the years of the different things I've heard. I've heard people, ministers, at the funeral, say, funeral service saying that the person who had died had gone to heaven and they there could look down upon the people that were attending the funeral service and they appreciated the condolences and the sympathy that was being expressed. I've heard other ministers say that the person who had died was asleep, would remain so until the resurrection morning. I've heard other ministers say that the person who had died had gone to purgatory, would stay there until their soul was cleansed purged, then they would go on to heaven. I've heard other ministers say the person who had died had gone to the first heaven, and they would stay in the first heaven until they worked their way up to the second heaven, and then to the third heaven until finally they reached the seventh heaven. And so you find there are a lot of different ideas about what happens to an individual when they die. In fact, scientists have even gotten into the uh, act and talk about it and I could take you down to the bookstore tonight and probably show you a dozen books that talk about how that when people die uh, they really don't die there's a lot of books on the market talk about how people see things and so forth and as I have read a number of those books I've been rather surprised because the scientists have all gotten involved in it and they all disagree with one another you know, really, there's not any of us that can talk out of experience. We're going to have to go to the Scripture. We're going to have to find out just exactly what does God's Word say happens to an individual when they die. What takes place? What happens? So I'd like for us to go to the Word of God and take a look tonight. And we're going to start out looking at a text here in Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter in verse 7. It says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. So it says that when a person dies, the Spirit returns back to God, and the, the body returns back to the what? To the dust. Now, we don't have too much trouble with that. We know what happens when a person dies as far as the body is concerned. We know that the body begins to decompose turning back to the dust. We've stood at the graveside. We've heard the minister say from ashes to ashes and from dust to dust. We know that when a person dies, his body decomposes. I don't know how many of you have ever had an opportunity to visit the city of New Orleans, but if you're ever there and you're sightseeing, don't miss the cemeteries. If you go to New Orleans and you don't visit the cemetery, you miss something. You see, the cemeteries in New Orleans are different 
because that city was influenced very much by the French. And the French bury people above ground. There's two reasons for that in New Orleans. One, it's a French custom. Secondly, all you got to do is stick a shovel on the ground to get water in New Orleans. See, so they bury them above ground in vaults like this. But if you're poor and you can't afford one of these vaults, well, then you can buy a piece of the cemetery wall. It looks like this. And they just buy a piece of the cemetery wall, and when the person dies, they're put in there. And then they brick up the front of it. And as I was walking through this particular cemetery, I was curious, and I saw one of those places where some brick had fallen out. And so I got me a large stone, and I got up on top of it, looked in, see what I could see. And sure enough, somebody had been buried in there, and they had decomposed until all that was left was a piece of the leg bone. Still laying in there, you could see that. They had gone back to dust, as the scripture says. The body shall return to the earth, dust to dust. But what about the spirit? When it says the spirit goes back to God who gave it, what does that mean? Is that something that looks like you, looks like me, that's able to walk through doors without opening them? What do we mean? What we need to do tonight is we need to define our terms when we talk about the body, when we talk about the spirit, when we talk about the soul. What are we talking about? What's the scripture referring to when it uses these terms? It begins to give us an idea of what it means by that word spirit. Notice says here in the book of James, for as the body without the spirit is what? Now that text says that if you take the spirit out of the body, what happens? Dies. The body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So it says if you reach in and you take the spirit out, the person is dead. Now what is that spirit? Job gives us an idea. As long as my breath is in me and the breath of God is in my what? Nostrils. You see, he's using that word in the old King James, and that text is out of the new King James. It says the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. That word spirit is used for breath. In Greek, it's the word pneuma. You see, we get several words in the English language for that. We have the word pneuma in Greek, but we get the word pneumonia. We get the word pneumatic. We drive cars that have pneumatic tires on them. That means tires with air in them. That has pneumonia is something, that a disease that affects the breath. That's what it means is the breath. So when it says that the spirit goes back to God who gave it, it's really talking about the breath of life that God gives. Now, I'm not talking about oxygen, folks. I'm not talking about oxygen. When it says a person dies, the spirit goes back to God who gave it. I'm talking about the breath of life that God gives. You take in the delivery room when a mother gives birth. I can tell you right now, if that child does not breathe, the doctor could pump oxygen into it all day long, wouldn't change it. It takes the breath of life. That has to happen. It says that when a person dies, that goes back to God who gave it. Now, the scripture begins to give us an idea of what's involved here in Genesis 2 and verse 7. It says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, that's the spirit, and man became a living being or a living being soul. That's what it says. Man became a living soul. In other words, it says that God took the dust of the ground. Here he formed Adam. And then it says that he took the spirit, the breath of life, and he put those two together and Adam became a living soul or a living being. You see, you are a living being soul because you have a body and you have the breath of life. It takes those two 
to make a living soul. That text does not say what some people want to read into it. It doesn't say that God here had a body, here he had the spirit or the breath of life, and here he had a soul and put the three together. It doesn't say that. It says it took the body and the spirit, and those two make a living soul. That's what it tells us takes place here. I was reading an article some while back about some scientists who were experimenting. You know, we're living in an age where they experiment with cloning and all this kind of stuff. And uh, these scientists decided they wanted to make an egg. So they took this egg and they broke it down in all its component parts. And when they had gone and analyzed it carefully, they began to put this egg back together. They made the egg and they got it all made and it says that they put it in a skillet and they fried it. It looked like an egg, smelled like an egg, and tasted like an egg. And they were quite encouraged with their experiment. And so they made another egg, and they made a shell. And they put the egg in the shell. And they said when they got the egg finished, you could put that egg and a hen's egg side by side, and you couldn't tell the difference. And then one of the scientists got a bright idea. He took that egg that they had made, and he put it under a hen. It won't work. It won't work. You see, there's something there. It takes the breath of life that only God can give. And it says that when a person dies, that goes back to God, the breath of life. You say, well, what do you mean? I, I don't understand the body and the breath or the spirit and the soul. What are you talking about? Well, let's see if I can help you understand a little bit because some people get the idea that the soul can't die, but the scripture says it can. Listen, behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Now, it can die. What you need to understand is, for instance, we live in a time in which we use a lot of computers. Uh, here we have a computer. Uh, we have the keys, uh, we have the boards, we have the monitor, the screen, all that. But that computer will not do one thing. I mean, it won't give us any information, it won't operate, it won't do one thing. There's a body there. There's the case, there's the monitor, there's the boards, there's everything there, except it needs one thing. It needs electricity. You see, you can have the computer, but if you don't have electricity, dear friends, it's not going to operate. And so when you take the body and you take the breath of life and you put those two together, then that computer is going to operate. It's going to give you information. It's going to turn out information. So when you take the body and you put the breath of life together, we become a living soul. We're able to think. We're able to remember. We're able to do things. When a person dies, that spirit, the breath of life, goes back to God, as we would refer to as electricity. On the resurrection morning, the body's going to form. God's going to put back in that body the breath of life, and that person is going to become a living soul. Now, you see, that's the reason God didn't start all over. That's the reason when man sinned that God didn't just wipe out the whole planet and forget it is because you are special. You see, there's memory. So with the computer, it's put down things in memory. So you have. And you are different. You're distinct than any other individual in the entire universe. And therefore, you are special. And on the resurrection morning, as that body forms again, the breath enters that person, they will become that individual again. That's what it's talking about. That's what it's referring to when it talks about the body, the soul, and the spirit. I run on to people that seem to think that, uh, you know, if you're good, 
uh, you're going to go to heaven. And if you're bad, you're going to go to hell. And, and they seem to think that you do that when you die. You know, going to go there when you die. If you're good, you're going to go to heaven when you die. And if you're bad, you're going to go to hell. If that's true, that does away with some of the great teachings of God's Word. It really does. For instance, it does away with the idea of the resurrection. Why do we need a resurrection if when people die, they go to heaven? Huh? In fact, I have a friend. She had taken her little girl, who was about four or five years old, out to the cemetery. They were putting some graves on their aunt's grave, and uh, they had placed the flowers there on the grave, and... They were standing there, and this little girl was thinking. I mean, her mind was really thinking this whole thing through. And she tugged on her mother's dress, and her mother said, what? And she said, uh, is Aunt Polly in there? And she said, no, Aunt Polly's not there. Aunt Polly's up in heaven. And the little girl thought that one through, and she said, then why are we putting the flowers here? And, of course, this throw, threw her mother completely off. She didn't know what to say, and she said, well, she said, Aunt Polly's body's there, and Aunt Polly's up in heaven. And the little girl thought that one through, and she said, you mean to tell me Aunt Polly's up in heaven running around without a body? <laughs> See, you get yourself in some real serious problems if we're not careful here. It does away with the need of the resurrection. It does away with the need of the judgment. You talk about getting in trouble. You let somebody die and send them to the bad place and then have the judgment and find out they didn't belong there and you've got a problem. It does away with the need of the second coming of Christ. So what I'm saying is this idea that you hear so many times that when people die, they go to heaven if they're good or to hell if they're bad. The Scripture says this. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy have now perished, neither more will they have a share in anything that's done under the sun. It says that when a person dies, they don't know anything. That's it. They don't know anything and won't know anything until the resurrection morning. It's what the Bible says. It gives some very clear examples. Probably one of the best examples in all of Scripture has to do with Jesus. Jesus had three very close friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They were brothers and sisters. And the Bible says that Lazarus was sick. So it says, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. They send a note to Jesus. Therefore his sis sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. They sent a note to Jesus, and they said, Lazarus is sick. Come and help him. Christ ignores the note. Doesn't pay, I mean, doesn't seem to pay any attention to it at all. Several days passed, a couple, in fact. And Jesus is talking to his disciples. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Mary and Martha and Lazarus. If you want to study the life of Jesus very, very carefully, you'll find that every time Jesus was under a strain, when he, when he had been up long hours and he needed rest, it's their home where he went. That's where he went to rest. They were very, very close to Jesus. So for Jesus to ignore this is unusual, very unusual. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus, what? Sleeps. But I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Jesus said, Lazarus is asleep. I'm going to wake him up. His disciples... Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. They said, if he's sleeping, you ought to leave him alone. <laughs> said, you shouldn't be bothering him. If he's sick, he's sleeping, he's going to get well. Leave him alone. 
However, Jesus spoke of his, come on, his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking a rest and sleep. So it's clear that Lazarus is dead. Now, Jesus heads out for Bethany. It's about a two days journey. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is what? Dead. No question about it. He's dead. All right. Takes him about two days to get to Bethany. When he gets out on the edge of town, Martha, Lazarus' sister, hears about it, and she runs out to meet Jesus. Now, you've got to listen to this conversation very carefully. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She said, if you had just come when we asked you to, he wouldn't have died. If you had been here, Okay, but I know that even now, whatever you ask of God, God will give you. She says that, but she doesn't believe it. She doesn't believe that. She's saying that, and don't be too hard on her. You do the same thing, don't you? I mean, haven't you prayed and then said, oh, the Lord's not going to do that? Now, if you don't believe she doesn't believe that, you just stay with me. We're going to see you in just a moment. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. He said, your brother's going to rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Not anything wrong with Martha's theology. She straight as this can be with the Scripture. She said, oh, I know that Lazarus is going to rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Do you know what's wrong with Martha? Huh? You know what's wrong with her? She doesn't know who she's talking to. Oh, she, he's a friend. And she knows it's Jesus, but she hadn't come to the place that she understands because, listen, and Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes on me, though he may die, he shall live. He's saying, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. She hadn't accepted that yet. He goes on down to the house and he talks to Mary. After he's talked to Mary for a little bit, he says, take me out to the tomb. So they go out to the tomb where Lazarus is buried. Jesus prays. Now listen, Martha, wasn't it Martha that said, I know whatever you ask of God, he'll give you? Isn't she the one who said that? Listen. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he's been dead four days. She said, don't take away that stone. He's been dead four days. Jesus ignores her says, roll away the stone. And when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said to them, loose him, let him go. Now, dear friends, if... This idea is true that when a person dies, he goes to heaven if he's good or to hell if he's bad. Then Jesus just played a very cruel trick on a very close friend. Because the shortest text in the Bible is right here when it says Jesus wept. He wept over the death of Lazarus. He was a good man. Certainly would have been a cruel trick for Lazarus to have been up in heaven and Jesus said, come on back down, Lazarus. You're going to have to live on this old earth a little longer. You don't hear Jesus saying, come down. You don't hear him saying, come up. You hear him saying, Lazarus, come forth. Do you know why he said, Lazarus, come forth? You know why? Because Jesus, if he had stood there that day and he would have shouted out across those hills of Bethany, 
come forth, every grave would have opened. He is the resurrection and the life. That's what he is. He said Lazarus is asleep. And so he says that people when they die are asleep and they'll wait the resurrection morning. Another clear scripture. Peter. Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost and this is what he says. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. When I go over to Israel, I go visit the tomb of David. There it is, huge tomb, coffin there, where David's buried. You can see it. It's right there. You might be saying, well, David's not in it. Well, let's see. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he said himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. He said, David isn't ascended into the heavens. No, David's asleep. David's waiting the resurrection. He's waiting for his Lord to come and call him forth. That's what it simply says. Now, you may be saying, but Brother Cox, uh, some texts bother me. You remember the thief on the cross? And you remember when he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom? And Jesus answered him, and Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. You say, boy, that sure sounds like he went to paradise that day. Yes, it does. Sure does. But I want to tell you something. There's not anything inspired about punctuation. The punctuation in your Bible is put there by man. Greek, Hebrew, no punctuation. When they wrote the scripture, they put it in the punctuation. So if you take that little comma there after you, I say to you, and you move the comma after the word today, that text reads different. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Two different thoughts altogether. This text is saying that he went to paradise that day. This text is saying that Jesus promised him on that day he'd be in paradise. Totally different things simply by moving the comma. Now, you may be saying, oh, Brother Cox, that's pretty weak. I think it is too. I believe it's true, but I think it's weak, so just hang on. We'll make it much clearer. You remember... Jesus has died, and it says here in John 19, verse 31, therefore, because it was the preparation day, that's the day before the Sabbath, that was Friday, the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. Now, let me explain that quickly. What you have here is you have Jesus dying on the 14th day at the time of the Passover. He's dying at the time of the Passover lamb. The 15th day is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It is an annual Sabbath, and you're having an annual Sabbath and a weekly Sabbath fallen on the same day. That makes it a high day, a special day to them, okay? For that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, they might be taken away. Now, why break their legs? Oh, there's a couple explanations. Some people say that they break their legs because if you crucify somebody and you break their legs, it throws all the weight on their arms and it'll cause them to suffocate. I have a hard time accepting that. And the reason I do is because there's been lots of people crucified. When they uh, overthrew Jerusalem, the whole valley was full of crosses and there's a lot of records where people hung on crosses for four and five days before they died. Well, I can tell you, you aren't going to hang there but a few hours and the strength in your legs are going to be gone anyhow. So I have a little trouble with that. You see, these men, Christ, the thieves, are convicted criminals. They don't want to take any chance of them getting away. So to take them off the cross and give them the slightest opportunity of escaping is not Roman thinking. So they break their legs. 
they guarantee they're not going to get away. They break their legs, take them down off the cross, and then after the festivity's over, they put them back up. That's what's going on here. Well, of course, they get to Jesus, and he's dead already, so they don't break his legs. Then the soldiers came, and they broke the legs of the first and the other who were crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Now, he's crucified, and these thieves are crucified late Friday afternoon. What I'm trying to tell you is Jesus, or excuse me, the thief didn't die that day. The thief didn't die that day. See, that's simply what it's saying. Jesus did. Okay, now we go to Jesus. You remember, he's died. They buried him. Mary has come to the tomb early in the morning while it's still dark. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, did not know that it was Jesus. Why didn't she know it was Jesus? She's crying. It's dark. She doesn't recognize him. So listen to what happens. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She supposing him to be the gardener said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I'll take him away. She thought he was the gardener. She thought somebody had taken the body of Jesus. Now listen very carefully. And Jesus said to her, Mary called her by name. She recognizes that voice. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say master, she jumps up and she runs and she's going to hug him. That's what she's going to do. She falls at his feet and throws her arms around his feet. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me. Now listen carefully. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet, what? Ascended to my Father. Jesus didn't go to heaven that day. See, very clear. But I go, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. No, Jesus didn't go to heaven. He's telling that thief, he said, on this day it doesn't look like I have a kingdom. On this day that men have spit in my face, on this day they plucked my beard, on this day that they've jeered me, I'm promising you, you'll have a place in my kingdom. That's what he was saying to him. Now you say, but Brother Cox... Does it really make a great lot of difference? Yes, it does. You see, across this country has moved in the last few years Eastern religions. And many people today are being taken in by Eastern religions. Eastern religions build their whole belief on the immortality of the soul, that the soul does not die. You better get real clear on what the Scripture says about it. Have you ever heard a spiritual called them bones, them bones, them dry bones? You ever heard that spiritual? Huh? Well, that came from Scripture. Did you know that? came out of the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel the 37th chapter. I want you to listen to this illustration. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley that was full of bones, so the prophet's brought out here, and it says that this whole valley is full of bones. And it says they've been out there a long time, and they're bleached. Then he caused me to pass by them around, pass by them all around, and behold, there were many in an open valley, and indeed they were very, what? Dry. They had been there a long time. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? Good question. So I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. The prophet said, I don't know. You know whether they can live. Thus saith the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Now listen what begins to happen. I will put sinew upon you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live, then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I'm going to do all this. All right. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together, bone to his bone. All those bones came together. You see, 
You remember the song? Leg bone connected to the knee bone, the knee bone to the... You remember how it goes right on down? All right. Okay, so bone came together, bone to his bone. Now the prophet continues. Indeed, as I looked, the sea knew and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. There they lay, just like at creation. They had eyes, but they didn't see. They had ears, but they couldn't hear. They had a heart, but it didn't beat. There was no breath in them. All right. Just bodies. There they were. And then it says, Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. Said, Tell them the breath to come and breathe on them the breath of life to come back into them. So I prophesy as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet in exceeding great army. See, there they rose. Just exactly. Now, dear friends, if you have a hard time believing that, he doesn't leave me any doubt because he compares that to the resurrection. And this is what he says about it. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves... I will put my spirit in you and ye shall live. See, there's that word spirit for breath. And I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. You see, he promises that's what's going to happen. And so, in the last days. You know, I have a lot of people say, Oh, I sure hope I'm living till the Lord comes. I'm not sure that I want to. I'm not sure that I want to live until the Lord comes. And the reason I'm not sure is I'm not sure I want to miss the resurrection. Just think of how fabulous that must be. I don't know that I want to be denied that privilege of the hearing, being in the grave and hearing the voice of God and the body forming and the grave opening. I don't know that I want to miss that experience. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I want to be living when the Lord comes. I'm not sure but what I want to die and enjoy the resurrection. How marvelous that must be. Promises that when all of God's people will be resurrected from the grave. Eight, after I had been married for 18 years, my wife died left me with two children, boy nine, girl 14. I can still remember sitting on the bed with an arm around each one of those children and all of us crying like babies. I can't possibly think of the time after that the struggle that the children and I went through to think that some people would say that she was up in heaven looking down there and seeing all that we were going through. I don't think she could do that and be happy. God's way is so much better. You see, he just simply says to that person who died today, and that person that died 6,000 years ago, that there is no time in death, that that person just simply closes their eyes, and when they close their eyes in death, it seems only as a moment, and they open their eyes to see the Lord come. Oh, how much better that is. How much better. That's why he says he gives his beloved sleep that that day's going to come. My wife's going to be resurrected. 
it will only be to her a moment. She closed her eyes in death, and she'll open them to see Jesus come in the clouds of heaven. How much better, how much wonder, more wonderful is God's way when he talks about those that are asleep in Christ Jesus. You see, it's going to be a marvelous experience. When they open their eyes, look up in the heavens and see Jesus come face to face, face to face with Christ our Savior. I want you to listen as Steve says. Tomorrow night, tomorrow night our subject is the prophetic 1,000 years of peace. What we're going to do tomorrow night is we're going to find out when this thousand years started, what goes on during this thousand years, when the thousand years is going to come to an end. We're going to find out what the devil's going to be during, doing during that time. We're going to find out where the righteous are going to be, where the wicked are. In fact, I was talking to a lady a while back, and we were discussing this question of the thousand years, and she told me, she said, we're already living during the thousand years. She said, we're already living during that time. And I said, well, the scripture says that the devil's going to be chained during that thousand years. And she said, that's right. And she said, he's already chained up. And I said, you're saying the devil's chained now? And she said, yes. And I said, well, it's on a rubber chain because he gets around to me quite often. <laughs> See? Well, when is the devil going to be chained? When is this going to take place? Well, that's what we're going to look at tomorrow night, an extremely important subject. And then I just want to say one word, make sure I'm right here. Yes, on Thursday night, I just want to say a word about Thursday night. I consider Thursday night the most important subject of the whole crusade. If I only had one sermon to preach to you, it would be Thursday nights. And the subject that night is entitled, The Time of the End. So, don't miss. Tomorrow night kind of sets the groundwork for Thursday night, so we hope that all of you will be sure to be back with us tomorrow night, and then again Thursday night. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the marvelous hope that we have in Christ our Lord, that He is the resurrection and the life. May each one of us here tonight in faith, accept thy grace, place our lives completely in your hands. For this we ask in Christ's name, amen. Good night. God bless each one of you.